Okay, so thank you everyone so much for joining us today on this 20th of March. Uh, my name is Dr. Brianna Young. I'm one of the Global Product Managers for Odometrics uh, Division of Natus, and I'm here to help moderate a webinar for you today titled Current Tinnitus Theories and Management Techniques, Part 1 of 2. So the uh, sneak peek on that is that we will have a Part 2 follow-up to this webinar, um, I believe, in September. So please stay tuned for more information on that. Keep checking back on our website. Um, to and when that specific date, um, when this part two of this webinar will be presented. And for today's speaker, I am thrilled to bring you Dr. Diana Colisano. She is an audiologist specializing in tinnitus and hyperacusis patients on the East Coast in the U.S. And at um, any point, if you need uh, more information about this webinar or have any other questions at the conclusion, you'll see my email address there on the screen. I'll post that again once the webinar is over, so you have that again as well later in the presentation. And like I mentioned, this is a part one of part two. You can view this webinar, the upcoming webinar, and any of our previous webinars that we've done by visiting that URL you see at the bottom of the screen. A couple of tips and tricks. You guys are muted right now to reduce background noise. We understand you guys are taking time out of your busy clinic schedules to be with us today. So if you have any questions during the session, um, there is a questions box that you should see on your webinar menu bar. Uh, feel free to type in those questions to me. Um, you can change the settings on that. So if you would like that to go directly to me and not to the entire group, you can do that via the drop down menu. I will gather all of the questions, um, compile them, and then towards the end of the webinar, then we'll have some time to go over that. If you have any technical difficulties or need assistance during this webinar, please message me directly again via that chat feature by selecting uh, moderators, or you can I think you can actually select me directly, Brianna Young. So with that, a little bit more about Dr. Calisano since we've taken care of the housekeeping. Um, Dr. Calisano earned her doctorate of audiology from Northwestern University in 2014, and after graduation, accepted her first professional position at the Hearing and Tinnitus Center, where she currently is today. So she has spent her entire career working with tinnitus and hyperacusis uh, patients, um, as well as, of course, patients with hearing loss and mesophonia as well. She has her Certificate of Clinical Competence in Audiology, so her C's from the um, ASHA, the American Speech Language and Hearing Association. She's also a fellow of the American Academy of Audiology, and as well as a membership in the um, American Tinnitus Association, or ATA. And she's also notably been trained professionally by Dr. Josh Abrop in 2016 in tinnitus retraining therapy. So with that, uh, Dr. Calisano, I will go ahead and turn the screen over to you. So thank you, and uh, thank you once again for joining us and, uh, and making this presentation for us today. All right, well, good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining us. Brianna, thank you for that lovely introduction. Um, this is something that is very near and dear to my heart. As Brianna mentioned, I have, um, since graduation, have been working closely with tinnitus patients as well as patients with hyperacusis and misophonia. And it is something that I have um, continued to be passionate about. I think it's a very underserved demographic in audiology. And my, my hope for today is for you to um, learn more about how to work with these patients, or if you have tinnitus yourself, um, you learn more about the onset of tinnitus, what causes tinnitus, um, certain things that can be done to manage tinnitus. One of the recurring themes, which we'll talk about, uh, is you know the the lack of um, or, or nothing can be done. And my goal for today is to just really emphasize that there are many things that can be done to help patients with tinnitus. So very briefly again, I'm Dr. Diana Calisano. I graduated in 2014 with my doctorate in audiology from Northwestern University. I started almost immediately after graduation at the Hearing and Tinnitus Center uh, for a very brief period of time. I worked at a large hospital setting in New York City, and I have since uh, taken on ownership of the practice in Long Island, so I am here full-time now. Our objectives for today include identifying some common theories or causes of tinnitus onset, um, so what makes it noticeable? 
I'd like to discuss some of the effects of tinnitus and how, um, how, how as clinicians we can better serve and assess our patients' tinnitus needs. Or if you are a patient with tinnitus, hopefully you can gain some um, knowledge as to how you can use your healthcare professional team to really um, gauge and get the answers that you need. I'd also like to review some current management techniques and then we will summarize everything that we've spoken about. So what exactly is tinnitus? Um, tinnitus has been defined as the perception of noise in the absence of external sound. The perception of noise being either in the, the head or at the, the level of the ears. But the idea is there is no other external stimulation but somebody is still perceiving a noise. Now tinnitus, when my tinnitus patients come to me, I I've truly have heard it all. I've heard them describe it as a buzzing, a hissing, a clicking sound. I've heard patients describe their tinnitus to be the sound of a Morse code um, or cicadas. So it, it manifests differently in each patient. There really is no rhyme or reason as to why for one person it may sound like a buzzing, the next person it may sound like a high-pitched ringing. But the take home here is that it really does manifest in many different ways. It can be chronic, it can be intermittent, it can fluctuate in volume. Um, there may be some impact of environmental factors including changes in barometric pressure, stress levels, different medications. So everybody, the same way that we say hearing loss is unique to the patient, tinnitus is unique to the patient as well. And for purposes of this webinar, we're going to be talking about non-pulsatile tinnitus. So pulsatile tinnitus really is a different type of tinnitus, but for this all intensive purposes, we'll be talking about subjective non-pulsatile tinnitus. There are about, on average, about 30 to 50 million Americans that report some degree of tinnitus. Really, what's interesting about tinnitus is while there are many people who acknowledge they have some degree of tinnitus, only about 20% of that population reports some emotional distress to tinnitus. So there, there becomes uh, the question of, well, what other system in our brain is at play that makes the tinnitus bothersome, distressing, or emotionally impactful? But we actually all have tinnitus. So back in 1953, Dr. Heller and Dr. Bergman did a study, and these two scientists wanted to postulate that only people with hearing loss had tinnitus, not people without hearing loss. So what they did is they placed 80 college-aged, normally hearing students in an anechoic chamber for about five minutes or less. And when those students came out, 93% of them reported a buzzing, a hissing, a clicking sound in their ears while they were in the anechoic chamber. So what that study shows us is everybody has tinnitus to some degree. There's always some spontaneous activity in the auditory pathways. Nothing is ever fully at rest. And in the auditory system, that's perceived as sound. But in the normal day-to-day -day life, we have access to many sounds around us that would normally help to mask out that tinnitus. So the tinnitus, or that perception of sound, hangs out in our subconscious. We don't actively perceive it. But when our hearing changes or when there's been any type of disruption in the auditory pathways, that tinnitus, that perception of sound, can become more and more noticeable. So while we all have tinnitus, there are certain extrinsic factors that might cause us to notice it more. So when I say causes of tinnitus here, I, what I really mean is what causes you to notice it, right? Because if we all have it, then something must cause you to notice it more so than previously. Now, there are many different reasons why tinnitus can be exacerbated. So first and foremost, it is typically hearing loss, and hearing loss can 
be secondary to you know Meniere's disease, it can be otosclerosis, it can be um, something as simple as a conductive hearing loss from wax in the ear. But hearing loss is usually one of the main culprits um, as to why patients notice tinnitus. Certainly noise exposure or um, exposure to a, a, a loud event can cause certain degradation to the hair cells or perhaps at the level of the auditory nerve. And that degradation can exacerbate or, or make tinnitus more noticeable. There are certain set, as some of us know, of ototoxic medications, whether you're talking about the platin family within uh, chemotherapy drugs, or you're talking about the myosin family, with, which is a subset of antibiotics. There are certain medications that have been known to be, be damaging to the inner ear. And when damage ensues in the inner ear, whether it's from the hair cells or at the, at the auditory nerve, there is likely to be a disruption in the homeostasis of the, of the inner ear. And so those inhibitory and excitatory functions that typically work against one another can actually cause an uptick in the tinnitus. Um, in addition to that, traumatic brain injury, concussions, if you're talking about any head trauma, Temporomandibular joint issues, or as many of us know as TMJ, that can also make tinnitus more noticeable. There are certain neurological conditions like MS, fibromyalgia, that have been linked to tinnitus as well. So there are many reasons as to why a patient may notice their tinnitus. It's not exclusive to just hearing loss. Uh, one of the other, uh, or two of the other conditions that I did not mention here. Um, tinnitus has been correlated to diabetes and cardiovascular disease, but primarily because those two conditions have been highly correlated with hearing loss. The impact of tinnitus is so, so unique to the patient. I cannot stress that enough. I have patients who walk in my doors who say, I don't really notice my tinnitus until you ask me about it. And I've had patients who have had to go out on disability because they are so deeply bothered by their tinnitus. Now, many patients will say it's an annoyance, it's irritating, uh, perhaps it disrupts their concentration or disrupts their motivational level if they're sitting at work and they're in a meeting and all of a sudden they hear this high-pitched tone, it can be very distracting. Sleep disturbance is one of the primary reasons, however, that tinnitus patients become more and more distressed by this condition. I say around, we, we joke all the time, we say sleep is a shrine. And if you're not sleeping well, forget about trying to get through the rest of the day. So if we do our best work when we sleep, the, that's when the brain heals. That's when the brain forms new neural collect connections and, and really solidifies those connections. And if you're not sleeping well, you're more likely to be irritable, to be anxious, to be fatigued the next day. So I really try to target and, and kind of probe how my tinnitus patients are sleeping or if they're having trouble sleeping. And that's usually one of the first um, one of the first steps that I try to, to address for these patients, because it, like I said, if you're not sleeping well, then trying to create a new experience or trying to help these patients heal becomes much more difficult. Tinnitus evaluation is an important part of the process. So first and foremost, we are collecting a, a very strong case history. Um, I, I am asking very specific questions, and I cannot stress enough that I am not just asking about their ears. As I said to you before, there are many other medical conditions that have been correlated with tinnitus. So nothing operates in isolation in the human body. So I'm asking about diabetes. I'm asking about cardiovascular disease. I'm asking about previous history of noise exposure. I'm asking about all of these things because I need to get a good understanding of where this patient is as they present to me that, that specific day. I need to know if they have any history of hearing loss in the family. 
So I use the case history to gauge um, some of their other medical conditions, but also I use tinnitus questionnaires to gauge how bothered or how distressed they are by their tinnitus. So whether it's the, um, you know, TFI, which we use pretty frequently here, um, tinnitus handicap inventory, um, sorry, that was the TFI, meaning the tinnitus functional index. And so, so ideally, I need to use those questionnaires to gauge, is this patient very distressed? Are they very bothered? Do I need to send them on to other professionals that is without them? not inside the scope of my practice, who else can I refer them to to get them help? During the tinnitus evaluation, I'm always performing standard and high frequency audiometry. I'm also measuring their loudness discomfort levels, as well as TIMPs, DPOAEs if it's warranted, distortion product, autoacoustic emissions. I'm, I'm really on the fence about acoustic reflexes because most of these patients present with either hyperacusis secondary to the tinnitus onset or just decreased um, loudness discomfort levels. And certainly I don't want any patient to feel uncomfortable. And then we go on to pitch matching, loudness matching, minimum masking levels and residual inhibition. And these are really just good uh, counseling points for patients as well. They really need to, I, f I find that most patients like to understand why they are experiencing certain, um, the, the tinnitus. There's nothing that can be done. So this sentence makes me itch. This sentence really just makes me itch because, you know, there may not be a medical intervention, there may not be a magic pill, but there are certainly ways that tinnitus can be managed. So to me, there are many patients who walk in my doors and they say this sentence to me. I went here and I was told that there was nothing that can be done. And there is no sentence to me that feels more hopeless than this sentence. So to a tinnitus patient who's looking for answers, who, who may be extremely bothered or impacted by their tinnitus, when they are said or told that there, there is nothing that can be done, that only reinforces how negative this experience is. So it is my mission to educate and to spread awareness about the different options that are out there. So I make it my business as a healthcare provider to know that if there is nothing I can do within the scope of my practice and I, my patients cannot be served with my services, I do know whom I can refer to, to to give these patients some other resources or some other outlets to explore um, rather than having it be a dead end. So I cannot stress enough, there may not be a medical cure, but there are many ways to manage the effects of tinnitus. Now, before we get into management techniques, I really just want you to think about a few things. I'd like to set the foundation because this is the reason why t tinnitus management techniques work. So I just want to start here. Think about every sound that you hear throughout the course of the day. There are many sounds that we hear, and many of those sounds do not reach our conscious level of awareness. So many of us sit in offices, quiet offices, and we probably have a ventilation system that is you know, playing in the back that you hear in the background. So physiologically, your ears are likely picking up on that sound. But because that sound is not important, your brain is not focused on that sound. So now the next day you walk into your office and your air conditioning system or your ventilation system is making a sputtering noise. Well, guess what? For most of us, our ears would go directly to that sound because it's new, it's foreign, and it's something that you probably have to react to. So every sound that we have, we perceive it and we evaluate it. Is it a threat? Is it not a threat? Do I have to pay attention to it or not? And we assign some level of importance to that sound. Now, another way to look at it is um, if you are a parent or if you've spent a lot of time around children um, over a longer period of time, you are probably in tune to what your child's 
hungry cry is versus their tired cry versus the I just want to get out of the crib cry. But to a stranger, that stranger may only say that baby is crying because to the stranger, there's no level of importance to that cry. But to the mother or father or family member of that young child, they know exactly what that cry means. So everything that we perceive, we perceive it in terms of its importance. Now, tinnitus, especially when it's new tinnitus, it typically is something that is new, it's foreign, and it's perceived as a threat. And because it's perceived as a threat, the brain hyperfocuses on it. Now, when it comes to tinnitus management techniques, most of the times tinnitus patients will say, I hear my tinnitus in quiet. It sounds very loud and quiet in quiet situations. And that's true because sounds are always perceived in contrast to their background. So if you read through the tinnitus literature, they, they typically compare tinnitus to a candle in a dark room. So if we were all in the same room right now and I shut the lights off and I light a candle, probably your eyes would go right to that candle because it's the only light source in the room. However, if I turn the lights on, now you're not picking up that candle's brightness as easily. The candle did not change. The brightness did not change. Your perception of it changed because of the contrast to the background. So I just want you to think about those different points as we're talking about sound therapy and some of the tinnitus management techniques. Each one of these categories could have its own webinar. So, so for purposes of today, it will be a very brief description of each. Now, sound therapy is something that we typically use often here in my clinic, and it comes in many forms. It can come in the form of a hearing aid or a combination device, depending on what the patient's hearing loss needs are. It can come in the form of cochlear implants for some people um, who have more significant or severe degrees of hearing loss, and that you know they it may not be. It's not necessarily um, that they are getting a cochlear implant to address their tinnitus, but it could be that in conjunction with addressing their hearing loss through a cochlear implant, they actually notice less of their tinnitus. There are tinnitus-specific devices out there, such as the Levo system or uh, neuromonics. So depending on the patient and what their lifestyle needs are, that may be something that is warranted for them. Or something as simple as sound producing apps. Many of the hearing aid manufacturers now have different apps that are available to them, um, or they can simply use a tabletop sound generator. So the idea with sound therapy is to introduce a very soft, low-level noise into the background so that your patient, when he, he or she is in a quiet environment, notices their tinnitus less. So the whole idea is not to eliminate, it's about providing relief. And again, it is very dependent on what the patient's needs are and as well what the patient's um, overall distress levels are. Tinnitus retraining therapy is another approach to addressing patients who have tinnitus. So it is based on um, the neurophysiologic model of tinnitus, which basically says that there are inhibitory and excitatory functions that work against each other to maintain the homeostasis in the inner ear. And when there's been any disruption to that homeostasis, there becomes a discharge of energy up to the brain. And so the brain makes a decision, do I pay attention to it or do I not? And so the whole goal with T TRT is to use directive counseling based on the neurophysiologic model in conjunction with sound therapy, and again, sound therapy comes in many forms, to really help the patient neutralize the sound of their tinnitus. So while it is there, it is not bothersome. Most of the studies that look at the efficacy of TRT are based on a 12 to 18 month time frame. So we can really only say that it takes about 12 to 18 months before habituation is, per, is perceived or benefit is perceived. Um, but certainly this is a viable approach for some patients. This is a very common model used in TRT. So really, again, it's, it points out that the source of the tinnitus starts in the cochlea the disruption or the discharge of energy ascends to the subcortical level of awareness where the brain makes a decision to pay attention to it. And if the brain makes a decision to pay attention to it, it may perceive it and evaluate it as something that is important or a threat. 
and it can become linked to the limbic system or the autonomic nervous system, which is responsible for your fight or flight. And that, in turn, may cause an exacerbation of the tinnitus because constant activation of those two systems puts the brain on high alert. And so there is a constant um, negative conditioned response feeding back into the tinnitus, making it more noticeable. The idea with tinnitus retraining therapy is to really peel back these layers to get the patient to a point where they notice their tinnitus, but it's not bothersome. As far as cognitive behavioral therapy goes, this is something that is typically used with um, patients who have chronic pain, but it has been recognized as a viable treatment for patients with tinnitus. So this is a, an approach that would be uh, um, overseen by a psychologist or a trained mental health provider. And it is really designed to challenge the negative thoughts, ideas, behaviors, uh, maladaptive beliefs that have formed around the tinnitus. So for some people, you know, they, they, there is kind of this constant chatter or worry that we have. Um, and if those thoughts continue to manifest, even if those thoughts are not rooted in reality, it may cause the patient to worry more about their tinnitus or, or focus more on their tinnitus. So this is really an approach that is designed to challenge those thoughts and ideas. This is actually one of the techniques that has been recommended by the American Academy of Otolaryngology as an evidence-based approach for, approach for tinnitus management. So it is something that can be very helpful for tinnitus patients who are more impacted. There are a variety of experimental options, um, and I emphasize experimental because there it really is not um, a whole lot of um, evidence in the literature to support that these options do work. Um, so, so I would encourage you to, you know, if you are considering some of these options, uh, and and by the way, some of them are are not necessarily available here um, in the U.S., but it's always good to first check with your physician if you are considering any one of these. So biofeedback really is a, a, a practice that is used for helping a patient to identify when psychological stressors are impacting them or causing a physiologic change in the body. So by viewing their body's response on a screen in front of them, they have a visual representation of how their body is reacting to certain uh, stressors in the environment. And as a result, it may help them to manage their tinnitus more efficiently because we know that stress can cause an uptick in the sound of tinnitus. Um, transcranial magnetic stimulation is a practice or more of a research-based based practice at this point in time that uses um, electromagnetic pulses via a coil um, that is typically placed near the scalp. And it's used to really modulate some of the uh, neuronal activity in the brain. So the idea is that as you, you faster, there are different pulse rates that are used, but faster pulse rates are thought to increase neural activity and slower pulse rates, of course, to reduce neural activity. So the idea would be to kind of reduce some of the overactivity in the brain. Cranial sacral therapy, oh, excuse me, I, I skipped acupuncture there. Acupuncture, again, is not something that has been used to directly or has been directly correlated with the reduction in tinnitus, but the line of thinking is if you have increased pressure in the head, the neck, any tension in the jaw, that acupuncture can be used to re release some of those trigger points or reduce some of that stress. And in turn, because the body is more relaxed, the patient may notice less of their tinnitus. Craniosacral therapy is something that I, or an approach that I'm questioned on fairly often, uh, more so recently. And it, it's a type of, um, it's a type of body work, it's a type of therapy that is used to kind of finesse some of the synarthroidal joints in the, in the cranium or the head to release some tension. So um, 
again, I'm not going to get too much into these experimental options, but certainly they are available um, and you should always check with your physician before you start any of them. So if this is you, I find that the patients who are more on this side, more to the left side of the screen, are oftentimes experiencing higher anxiety levels, higher stress levels. They are more worrisome. So you have to really think about, is your patient mindful or are they mindful? And the reason the distinction therein lies that the patients who are experiencing more worry, more stress, more anxiety, are more likely to be emotionally involved when it comes to their tinnitus. So, and it's not to say that it's not a, a one-size-fits-all approach, but certainly the more mindful you are, the, the more present you can be, it oftentimes helps to calm the limbic system, calm the nervous system. Meditation is also a very undervalued tool. I find that when I recommend this to some of my patients, <laughs> sometimes it is met with kind of a smile or a giggle. Um, but truthfully, if you think about all of the different options that I presented today, meditation has been around for hundreds of thousands of years. So meditation is being used to mitigate how chronic pain is perceived in the brain. So if we can, if we can change that, then why can't we use meditation to change the way the brain perceives the tinnitus? And if a patient can use meditation consistently to feel more calm and more in control when it comes to their tinnitus, that in and of itself is a very powerful tool. So I recommend meditation to many of my patients. And of course, there are um, certainly different meditation apps that can be, you know, the, the meditation apps are endless now. So again, it's a very undervalued tool and one that can be tremendously helpful. Just a quick note about tinnitus supplements. Um, I, I personally am not a huge fan. Uh, I would encourage any patient who is even considering this to, of course, always check it with their physician first. You always want to make sure that there are no medical contraindications if you're going to be starting a new supplement. But I can say this, that there's really no evidence in the literature beyond a 50% success rate um, to demonstrate that these supplements work. And as we all know, 50% is about placebo effect. So to me, the other techniques that I discuss today are typically more impactful in helping patients manage their tinnitus. If a patient wants to try a supplement and they, they are you know, really pushing for it, then I say to them, by all means, but certainly check it with your physician first. So before we end, I believe we have just a few minutes left. Um, before we end, I do just wanna highlight two recent um, research efforts that have gained more traction over the last few years um, in regards to addressing hearing loss and addressing tinnitus. So some of you may be familiar with the Frequency Therapeutics Company, which is based in Boston. They were established in 2015 as a tech startup. Um, they are using a proprietary combination of molecule drugs, basically. It's it's called progenitor cell activation. So the idea is they're using these, this approach to generate the molecules that are needed to regrow hair cells. Um, again, it's gained more traction over the last few years. And if they are, I believe right now on pause in regards to recruiting for their clinical trials, but certainly if you are interested or you have a patient who is interested, I reached out to them recently myself for, uh, on behalf of one of my patients. Um, you can visit clinicaltrials.gov. So that is definitely one of the companies that we will, that, you know, we continue to track. 
And some of you may have also heard of the research coming out of the University of Michigan. So um, Dr. Susan Shore and her team there were looking at the different parts of the brain that may be activated, um, not exclusive to the auditory system, but other parts of the brain that may be responsible for the exacerbation of tinnitus. So in normal hearing, um, the dorsal cochlear nucleus is really the first uh, stop for signals coming from the ear. Um, but there's a lot of multitasking that goes on in the dorsal cochlear nucleus. So there are, it is believed to be that there is, in, in a patient who has been exposed to loud doses of noise, there is overactivity in some of the somatosensory nerves after that noise exposure. And that overactivity results in basically an overcompensation for the loss of function in the auditory nerve. So Dr. Shore and her team were using a bimodal auditory somatosensory approach to mitigate the overactivity in those parts of the brain. So again, they just, I believe, finished their second phase last year. Um, and so we are hopeful to see what other information may come out of that, that study. So in summary, um, there are many causes, or I should say there are many different conditions that may make you notice your tinnitus. So again, we all have tinnitus, but what causes you to notice it may be different for each patient. Um, every patient will be impacted differently. It's as unique as your fingerprint. Some patients do just fine. Other patients need more support. So it's our job as clinicians to really key in to what our patients need. Um, as with anything in life, I think it's always important to read between the lines. Don't overinterpret, but read between the lines. You know, what is your patient not telling you based on what they're telling you? If you feel in your gut that this patient needs to be referred on to a mental health provider or a psychologist, don't be afraid to make that recommendation, no matter how it's received by your patient. You have to be the healthcare provider. You are taking this patient's care into your own hands. And so knowing when to refer on and knowing what you can do to help this patient. And by the way, there's not a one size fits all approach. So there are some patients that I may use sound therapy, TRT, um, you know, we, I might recommend that they go for biofeedback. So it's, it's not a one size blanket approach. If you take home one thing today, please take home that although there may not be a cure, there are certainly ways to help our patients manage their tinnitus. So that I cannot stress enough. Um, and there, there are certainly current research efforts that give us hope in finding a cure for tinnitus and or hearing loss. So I'd like to thank you for your time today. This is my information here. Uh, I have a, an office in Long Island, but I can also be reached by email. Um, you can visit my website. I'm happy to field questions about tinnitus. I, of course, love talking about it. Um, I enjoy educating about on this topic. So please feel free to reach out to me if you have any questions um, privately. And here are my references. And I'm going to turn it back now over to Brianna. All right, thank you so much, um, Dr. Calisanos. That was a wonderful presentation. Thank you, thank you. So um, I think we have time for maybe just a couple of questions, but again, always feel free to contact um, Diana directly or um, you can see my information is here on the screen as well. So if you think of something later and you can't quite remember, um, the webinar will be live on our website and on YouTube uh, probably um, within a week or two. So if you've registered, you'll, of course, get that link sent to your email. But um, for those of you maybe watching live, um, you can always contact me at brianna.young at natus.com, or you can reach out to Dr. Colasanos directly as well. So thank you for that. Um, we do have just a couple of questions, and I, I do apologize. We won't have time to get to them all. But if you think of anything else, please, um, you said contact us, and we'll be more than happy to address your questions offline. 
But uh, one question was, um, what professions do you most commonly refer out to? So you mentioned re um, this referral source. I think this person was just wanting some clarification on who are the most common sure. culprits. Sure. So um, we actually have a whole network. We have CBT therapists that we refer to. We refer uh, pretty frequently to neurootologists. And for anybody who doesn't know what that is, um, a neurootologist is an ENT that goes back to school for a few additional years of training and focuses on just the ears. So they are much more well versed in the neurology of the ear. So we refer to neurootologists, we refer to neurologists, we refer to, um, you know, I, I have even referred to cardiologists if I, if I recognize or endocrinologists if people uh, start to, you know, highlight if they have any um, di diabetic issues that are unmanaged or, you know, they're having uh, blood pressure issues. So so we have a whole network, but most often we are referring to neurootologists. So if you don't know a neurootologist in your area, that's okay because there are not many of them out there, but it is really important for you to have kind of a network of people that you can reach out to. Um, so if you, even if, you know, there's the closest neurotologist that you can find, you may want to reach out to that person and uh, strike up a relationship because it's a very important uh, person to have on the team. Okay, great, thank you. And then uh, I think we have time for maybe one more. Um, how can someone, I see the question here, how can we phrase this? Um, how can someone learn more about uh, TRT, so that tendinitis retraining therapy, and even possibly do a certification? Do you have a resource for that? Sure, so you can actually go to um, doc, Dr. Dr. Jasterboff and his wife, Dr. Jasterboff, um, do trainings, uh, I believe in, in Maryland still. So you can actually look them up online. Um, and they typically, I believe, give trainings uh, twice a year, once in the spring, once in the fall or the end of the summer. So that is that is certainly a place that you can gain uh, tremendous insight as to um, how to how to practice TRT. And so I would I would refer you to doc, Dr. Jasterboff. And if that person is looking, I can I don't have the website in front of me right now, but certainly I can get that information. Hang on just a second. Sure. Wonderful. Thank you. Bear with me. Uh, let's see here. So if you go to Dr. Jastrobov's website, it's www.tinnitus, T-I-N-N-I-T-U-S, dash, P as in Peter, J as in John, J as in John, dot com. Typically, they will put up their next training session, which looks to be May 30th through June 1st, 2019. Wonderful. Thank you so much for that. My pleasure. And, um, and with that, yeah, we are running right about at our 45-minute mark, so we'll go ahead and have to conclude for today. Again, thank you so much, everyone, for taking the time out of your busy clinic schedules, your personal lives. This is a global webinar. We understand some of our friends are attending very late in the evening. So thank you so much for coming to um, this webinar on tinnitus. Yes, thank um, you. And Dr. Calasanos, again, thank you so much for giving of your time to develop this presentation for us and for agreeing to do the part two session, which will come in September. So thank you in advance for that as well. My pleasure. All right, so take care everyone and we'll hopefully have you join us for our next webinar. Have a good day.